the topic for discussion this morning is fellowship. And uh, this is a pretty controversial topic. Uh, as we think about the Bible's teaching concerning who we as Christians and who we as a congregation should partner with. And, uh, you know, usually when we use the word fellowship in the church, we use it concerning the social functions of the church. You know, we're having a, a fellowship meal. Or, you know, the youth last night had a, a movie night. They're having a fellowship night. And, and that's the way that we usually think of the word fellowship. But, uh, but really, that's, that's not the focus of the word fellowship in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that there's no context in the New Testament where you could see fellowship carrying with it those ideas at all. You know, I, I think certainly, as we'll notice in a minute, Acts 2 would lend itself to the notion of having shared meals and that sort of thing. But, but that's not the primary focus of the word fellowship in the New Testament. So, um, the word fellowship, it translates a Greek word, koinonia. And uh, you, may, you may notice just that word koinonia, our word coin comes from it. And so common is kind of the idea uh, behind the word koinonia. Uh, the Greek in which the New Testament was written is called koine Greek, common Greek. Uh, there was a time when uh, scholars thought that the New Testament was written in a wholly different Greek because uh, the style was different from classical Greek and there were, as memory serves me, prior to the discovery of some papyri in Egypt in the late 1800s, there were about 500 words in the Greek New Testament that weren't attested anywhere in other ancient Greek literature. But through the discovery of those papyri, it was learned that the Greek of the New Testament was just the Greek that was spoken on the streets in the first century. And so it's Koine Greek, it's common Greek. And so the idea of koinonia, I've got the definition there from uh, Frederick Danker's concise Greek-English lexicon. It's a close association in shared interest. And a related term in the New Testament, koinonos, is often translated partners, and that's, that's the idea, partners. Look at Luke 5, Luke chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I'm going to roll my sleeves up. may not look good for the video, but I'm starting to get a little warm. Luke 5, so, so Luke 5 is uh, Luke's parallel to what we read in Matthew 4 and Mark 1, Jesus calling uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his disciples. And uh, it takes place by the Sea of Galilee, and it takes place after this miraculous catch of fish. Peter and um, Andrew, James, and John, they've been fishing all night. They haven't caught anything, but Jesus, after teaching, gets in the boat and uh, you know, tells them to uh, you know, let down their nets, and they catch this huge catch of fish, so, so much so that uh, you know, uh, you know, the boats begin to sink. There's so many fish. And so Luke 5, verse 10 says this, And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's, and of course that's Peter's, partners. And that's, that's from our word, koinonos a partner. And so when we think about how fellowship is used in the New Testament, I've got um, you know, five different ways in which we see you know, that word, that, uh, that uh, close association and shared interest, how that's used in the New Testament. Okay, so, so first of all, we see that it's used concerning a saving relationship with God and Jesus. So uh, look at 1 Corinthians 1.9. Well, no, don't look at that. Look at 1 John 1.3. 1 John 1.3. Because that's going to include both the Father and the Son. 1 John 1, verse 3. And here John, uh, using the we, probably referring to himself and the other apostles, though as best we can tell, he's the only living apostle at that time, but they're... Their testimony remains. 1 John 1, 3, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, talking about 
their experience uh, uh, of, of seeing and hearing Jesus during his earthly ministry, his death and his resurrection, so that we proclaim to you what we've seen in her, we declare to you the gospel, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So whenever we obey the gospel through the apostolic witness, we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. We enter into this relationship with the Father and Son that involves us sharing in the benefits of Jesus' death and his resurrection and all the blessings that come therewith. So that's the first way that fellowship is used in the New Testament. A second way that it's used in the New Testament is relative to the Lord's Supper, which we're about to eat. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. And the context of this is uh, that Paul is correcting the Corinthians now for their participation in idolatry. He brought it up just, just kind of in passing in chapter 8, but now he's getting down to where the rubber meets the road. And there are some Corinthians who are so enlightened and they think, well, since you know idols don't have any real existence, it's okay to go to the idol's temple uh, and, and, and participate in the sacrifice to the idol and eat the sacrifices and that sort of thing since the idol has no real existence. And, and Paul says, no, you can't do that. And, uh, and here's what he says in, in that context, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving, and he's talking about the fruit of the vine, for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread, the unleavened bread, that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And by the way, I, I might just stop here to say, um, to me, this passage seems to indicate that there is more to the Lord's Supper than just the common kind of evangelical memorial view that all we're doing when we eat the Lord's Supper is remembering Jesus' death on our behalf. It seems to me like there actually are, uh, or there actually is spiritual blessing conferred to the person who eats the Lord's Supper. There is a sense in which we're participating in the blessings of the death of Jesus when we eat the Lord's Supper. Now, I don't think there's uh, New Testament evidence to substantiate a Catholic view. You know, the Catholics teach that uh, the Mass, is what they call it, uh, is, is actually a, a, a re-sacrificing of Jesus, and that when the priest blesses the loaf and when the priest blesses the wine, that they actually tra change forms, transubstantiation, that there's a sense in which the bread becomes the body of Jesus and the uh, blood becomes the blood of Jesus. And so there's, I said it's a, a re-sacrifice. They don't view it necessarily as a re-sacrifice, but a representation of the sacrifice uh, of Jesus to God. And so one of their sacraments, which sacrament is not a word that occurs in the New Testament, but, but it just means um, a, a way to give grace to someone, a, an, an avenue through which God gives grace to someone. One of their seven sacraments is the Mass. And so a Catholic's uh, having his or her sins forgiven is dependent upon participating in the Mass. And, you know, I would be so bold as to say that a child of God's forgiveness for sins is dependent upon our coming to church in the assembly and eating the Lord's Supper. Because it's as we walk in the light as he is in the light that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. You know, I would not go so far as to say that we're unforgiven until we eat the Lord's Supper, but eating the Lord's Supper is, in some sense, a participation in the blood of Christ, and it is a condition for having our sins continually forgiven. So, you know, in light of Hebrews 10, 25 and following, where we're told, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, and then he warns, if we sin willfully, etc., etc., and, and that passage... He, he, the, the, the Hebrews are in danger, the Hebrew Christians are in danger of total apostasy, but, but whenever the Hebrews writer says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more, 
habit of some, that doesn't seem to lend itself to this idea of total apostasy. It seems to lend itself more to the idea of not assembling with the church when you have the ability to. But, but anyway, the passage goes on to warn in the starkest terms against that. So, so I would say that there is something significant that goes on when we eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, it is, it, it, I mean, there's a reason why Luke in Acts 20 verse 7 says, on the first day of the week, when the disciples assembled together to eat, to break bread, to eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, it, it is truly the most important thing we do every week. All right, so that's, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that I'm teaching the Lord's Supper. I probably <laughs> treaded on someone else's ground, so I apologize. Uh, I just sometimes lack self-control. All right, so, so notice number three. What fellowship refers to, a, a, a brotherly relationship of love with one another because of a shared faith. Look at 1 John again. 1 so John 1, 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. So we've shared the gospel with you so that you can have fellowship with us, the apostles, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Christ Jesus. So, so we have fellowship with one another, we'll notice in just a minute, because we have fellowship with God and with Christ. Drop down to verse 7 of 1 John 1. But if we walk in the light, passage we referred to a moment ago, as he is in the light, that is, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So, so when we are faithful to God, we have fellowship with one another. I thought uh, Jack Lewis's illustration of this was really good. He said, you know, uh, your watch you know, may say that it's, you know, 9.45, and my watch may say that it's 9.47. But if, if we both set our watch by the official standard, where, where is the official standard? Colorado. Colorado, where, wherever it is. If we, if we both set our watch by the official standard, then our watches will agree with one another. And so if you're walking in the light as God is in the light, you're living as God would have you live, and if I'm living as God would have me live, then we're going to be in agreement with one another because we're both in agreement with God. And that's, that's the idea of the passage. All right, uh, a fourth usage of this word fellowship, it's a sharing of material goods. Look at Acts 2.42. So, and, and while you're turning there, I should have added this to that last statement. So, you know, oftentimes Christians aren't together on things. They aren't together on what they believe. They aren't together on how they live. And so, you know, if you believe one thing about Christian doctrine, and I believe another thing about Christian doctrine, or if you're behaving in one way as a Christian, I'm behaving in another way with a Christian, here's what's for certain. One or both of us is not in harmony with God. And so that, that's, that's an important point. Okay, Acts 2.42. Uh, a summary of what the early church did after they were baptized. And by the way, this passage, when you read this in light of the earliest Christian description <coughs> of a Sunday assembly of the church, which was written about 150 by Justin Martyr in his first apology, <laughs> what, what Luke describes in Acts 2.42 is exactly what Justin Martyr describes in, in his first apology. It's, I mean, if you just Google it, you can see it. It's, it's uh, uh, chapter 167 of his first apology. Anyway, Acts 2.42 says this, They, the early Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So what did they do regularly? What, what did they do when they came together? Well, they had teaching or preaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They ate the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, a synecdoche for the Lord's Supper where you eat the bread and drink the cup. 
and to prayer. They had congregational prayers. Well, what does the fellowship have reference to there? Well, the fellowship is fleshed out for us as we read down in the context. Look at verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything, note this, in common. And in in the Greek, the word there translated common is related to that word fellowship, koinonia, in verse 42. So they had all things in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So what's the fellowship that they engaged in? It was a sharing, a sharing of their material goods. They gave when they came together. And then there was a distribution, we see, you know, I mean here, but also in Acts chapter 6, to those who were in need. Well, also Acts chapter 4. All right, and the fifth way that fellowship is used in the New Testament is a partnership in spreading the gospel. Um, Here's a passage that we've referred to in our study of Philippians. Look at Philippians 1 verse 5. Philippians 1 verse 5. Well, let's read verses 4 and 5. Paul says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. They were partners with Paul. How were they partners with Paul from the first day until the present day? Well, remember what happened that first day? Lydia obeyed the gospel, and she invited Paul and Silas and their crew to stay in her house. So she supported them. She was their partner. And then, of course, we learn in in, uh, Philippians 4, verse 3, that Euodia and Syntyche and others were uh, were striving together with Paul to share the gospel. So, So they're all doing what they can do in order to get the gospel to as many people as possible. And that's what Christian fellowship is about. All right, any any comments on that before we move into the the body of the lesson? And so so don't misunderstand me. I don't think, for instance, that um, what uh, the youth did last night is not in some sense fellowship, getting together to watch a movie and to enjoy one another's company. I mean, that's all all good. And, And we need to do stuff like that. But that is not the main emphasis of the New Testament's teaching on fellowship. New Testament fellowship is us working together for the cause of the Lord. Our shared interest is in getting the gospel to as many people as possible. And that's that's really the focus of New Testament fellowship. All right, well, let's think about some conditions for fellowship. And, you know, the real um, focus, well... Let me say this <laughs> before, we, before we do that, just on the last comment. So, so, so the point that I, would, that I would make out of that last comment is we need to be serious about our faith. Faith is about getting serious about the matters that matter. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people want a church for a social club, that, for relationships. And relationships are so important, and these are relationships. But our, but our relationships are not based upon the fact that we root for the same football team or we have the same hobbies or anything like that. That's not the basis of our relationship, that I like your personality and you like my personality. That's not the basis of our relationship. The basis of our relationship is that we both fully believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for our sins and he was resurrected and he's going to judge every person one day and everybody has to know the gospel. And so because we both believe those things, that holds us together even when our personalities don't mesh. Right? That, that's what holds us together. Okay, uh, so down to one. Conditions for our fellowship. You know, the real um, question of the chapter concerns whom we should fellowship in the local church. And... Um, Brother Lewis gives us a couple of examples to show us that we need to be careful about that. Uh, it, it's not the case that we should strive to be ecumenical. 
and to be one with everybody. That's, that is not a virtuous thing according to the Bible. And let's look at a couple of his examples. Go back, let's just take both of them from the book of 2 Chronicles. So go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. So you know when the kingdom of Israel split between the northern kingdom, you know, the ten tribes in the north that was known as Israel and the tribes in the south known as Judah, uh, northern Israel had no good kings. Southern Judah had only a few. And one of the good kings of uh, Judah was a man by the name of Jehoshaphat, And one of the worst kings of Israel was a man by the name of Ahab. But notice what 2 Chronicles 18 says. Let's look at uh, verses 1 through uh, 3. But Jehoshaphat had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. And by the way, that, that almost destroyed the southern kingdom. In fact, if God were not providentially active, that would have destroyed our chance of salvation by God's promise through Abraham. Because the royal line from which Jesus came got down to one person because of that intermarriage. Important lesson to draw from that is those who are contemplating marriage need to be careful who they marry because bad things can come from marrying the wrong person. Verse 2, some years later, he went down. Now, so, so Jehoshaphat went down to see Ahab and Samaria. Now, if you look at a map, he actually went north. But even though we typically speak of going down as going south and going up as going north, Jehoshaphat went down from Jerusalem when he went north to Samaria because you always went down when you left Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem was, was 2,550 feet above sea level, and you always went down when you left there. And, and probably also the, there may be some significance because of the, the spiritual significance of Jerusalem. I mean, it's not the tallest mountain in the area. I mean, in fact, uh, right next to it, the Mount of Olives is higher by 100 feet or so than what, uh, what Jerusalem is. But it is certainly a very significant place spiritually. So he went down to see Ahab, and and I'm, again, wasting our time with superfluous details, but that's what I'm good at. So Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him and the people with him and urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. So notice, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, be my partner. Let's go and attack Ramoth Gilead, which of course, is across the Jordan River. It was a part of Israel's territory, but because of Israel's unfaithfulness, You know, God had allowed it to be taken over by the Arameans who ruled in Damascus. And so Ahab says, partner with me, Jehoshaphat. Verse 3, Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And here's what Jehoshaphat replied. I am as you are, and my people is your people. We will join you in the war. Well, Was that a good thing? Because Ahab, he didn't just worship the calves that Jeroboam had made. He he also introduced Baal worship. And Jehoshaphat believes that Yahweh is the only true God. And so here you've got one who worships the one and true God joining in, being a partner with someone who is an idolater and who has taken part in the killing of the prophets of Yahweh. But Jehoshaphat said, listen, I want to be ecumenical. I want to mend the breach that's happened. And so it's, it's better to work together. So yeah, I'll go with you. You know, that seems like a good cause because Ramoth Gilead is a part of the land that, that God gave Israel initially. It's not right for the Arameans to be occupying it. So they went. I mean, there's a lot more to the story. Uh, Ahab ends up dying in battle. And here's what Jehoshaphat is told when he gets back to Jerusalem. Look at chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. When Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the seer, so seer is a name for a prophet. Um, I think it's 1 Samuel 9, 9 where that's defined. Jehu the seer, the prophet, the son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, 
Quote, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of the Asherah poles, idols, and have set your heart on seeking God. But here he is rebuked for his ecumenical spirit. Should you uh, help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? By the way, who hates the Lord? I know we think uh, of hate in terms of emotion, but biblically speaking, what does it mean to love the Lord? And conversely, what does it mean to hate the Lord? Obey That's it. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So even if someone says, oh, I love the Lord, but they are disobeying the Lord and won't repent, in reality they don't love him, they hate him. So, so the point of the passage is we should not uh, join up with and be partners with those who are consistently disregarding scripture. Okay, uh, I've got the other example from Second Chronicles uh, that Jack Lewis uses there, but we're going to pass over it for now just because of, of time. But, but an inference, look at C under A. An inference that can be drawn is that we should have fellowship only with those who are in fellowship with God. And notice, notice 1 John 1. And we'll make the same point that we made from 2 Chronicles 19.9, but I think it's helpful to make this point... Um, in a couple of ways. First John 1 John 1.5 says this, This is the message we have heard from Him, that is from Jesus, and declare to you. So the apostolic message, God is light, in Him there is no darkness at all. To say that God is light means that God is absolutely holy. Darkness here stands for sin. So God's way, the way of Scripture, is the way of light. Anything contrary to Scripture is the way of darkness. Verse 6, If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Now I was, I was talking to someone the other day whose life was very, very contrary in in. A, a particular area, living with someone to whom they're not married, so having a sexual relationship with someone to whom they're not married, and this person said, listen, God and I are good. We've, we've got it worked out. We, I talk to him all the time. We're in a, in a right relation. I'm in a right relationship with him. We're good. And this is the passage. It says, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Just claiming something is so does not make it so. We have to do what the Bible says. All right, so, so with whom may we have fellowship in the church? Well, let's think about whom we accept as members of the church. Look at B. Uh, we won't take time to read these two passages, but, but a related word to koinonia occurs in Titus 1.4 and Jude verse 4 uh, in, a, in an adjectival form. So, so Titus 1.4 says we have a common faith. And Jude verse 4 speaks of the common salvation. So those that we should have fellowship with in the church are those who have a common faith and as a result share in our common salvation because it's koinonia. It's a, it's a shared relationship. And so um, I put this passage down just because this is, this is that point in time when we, as a result of a common faith, actually share in a common salvation. Look at Galatians 3. Look at verses 26 and 27. 
Paul says, so in Christ Jesus you are all the children of God through faith. So, so that prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus, that tells us the realm in which we are children of God through faith. We're children of God through faith when we are in Christ Jesus. The question is, how do we get into Christ Jesus? Verse 27 tells us that. For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ. So, you know, we have fellowship with those who are in the family of God. We become a part of the family of God in Christ Jesus. How do we get into Christ Jesus? Well, it's when we, by faith, are baptized into Christ. That's when we're in Christ Jesus. That's when we're the family of God. And so Paul goes on to say, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's, there's our fellowship that we have. We are one in Christ Jesus, regardless of our race, regardless of our social standing, regardless of our gender. If we, by faith, are baptized into Christ Jesus, we're the family of God and we're to be one with one another. But, of course, the implication of that is in the church, we can't accept into our fellowship those who have not, by faith, been baptized. You know, we, we can't accept those who, for instance, say they were baptized, but you say, well, what, what does that mean? And they say, well, my parents had me sprinkled when I was a baby. Well, that's, that's not what the Bible calls baptism. Uh, you know, on that, tur turn over a book to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 4. What time is it? 10.05. Okay. Um, look at it. Do I want to say this? I know, no, we can't say this now. We need to move on. Okay. So... Um, Go to go to C, go to C. Um, we may only have fellowship with those who have been baptized into Christ, who continue to live in harmony with Jesus' will. So, person's got to be baptized and have faith to enter into our fellowship. But to remain in our fellowship, they have to continue to live as Jesus taught. And you remember what we saw, First John one seven. I mean, we've read it a couple of times, so. John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So what about those who refuse to walk in the light? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. And you know the situation here with 1 Corinthians 5. And I want to... I'm going to make this point pretty quickly and then, and then we'll move into point two because there are some things we need to say in, in two. But you know the situation in 1 Corinthians 5. You had a brother in the church who was having a sexual relationship with, it seems, his stepmother. And the church at Corinth, they were so broad-minded, they were accepting this brother and they were so proud of themselves for the broad-mindedness continuing to allow this brother to attend services, to eat the Lord's Supper with them, to, to, to fellowship with them, speaking in a social way. Otherwise, they're so proud of themselves. But here's what Paul says, and I'm going to read a good bit of the chapter, and, and we need to ask ourselves the question, is Jesus really Lord of our lives? Is Jesus really Lord of the church? would we be willing to do this? Because we don't have a right to call Jesus our Lord if we wouldn't be willing to do this. Paul said it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, 
I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus. So notice, this carries with it heaven's authority. In the name of our Lord Jesus, on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled, by the way, this shows that The assembly on Sunday isn't just for preaching and for praying and for giving and for eating the Lord's Supper and for singing. More can be done in the assembly, including church discipline. So when you are assembled together, this is to be done before the congregation. And I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The goal, ultimately, is salvation. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread of, un, uh, of leaven, uh, the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world, that is, outside of the church, those who haven't obeyed the gospel, who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or slanderer, a drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are not, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading. Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Now, I don't enjoy, as Brother Lewis said, I don't enjoy that any more than you do. That's not a comfortable passage to read, but that's in the Bible. And, and the Bible actually would define that behavior as love by biblical definition. Now, a lot more needs to be said about that, but, but let's move on. One thing I want to notice under Roman numeral 2, concerns about fellowship, is this in 2 John 9. Turn to 2 John 9 for a moment. We need to be careful that we don't support false teaching. 2 John 9. Don't ask what chapter. We'll read through verse 11. And I'll hold my Bible up where I can actually see text. Anyone who runs ahead literally progresses. The term progressive doesn't have a a positive connotation in, in the New Testament. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Don't support them in their teaching. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Now what is the teaching of Christ here? I think in the context it has to be the teaching that Jesus came in the flesh, the incarnation. Verse 7 makes that clear. But in principle, this applies to any serious false teaching. John says that whenever we support it, then we are just as guilty as the one who teaches false doctrine. And so it is so important what sort of ministries we support. You know, just, just, just a quick example. My grandmother uh, was baptized at 72. She, she had been a Sunday school teacher in the Baptist church for years. And she had supported the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association for years. And the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association does a lot of good things. You know, Samaritan's Purse and various things grew out of that. Great benevolence efforts. But Billy Graham lies to people. Well, he did. He's, he's dead now. But the association lies to people, telling them that if they just ask Jesus into their heart, they'll be saved. And so one of the first things that my 
grandmother did when she obeyed the gospel was she stopped supporting the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. We have to be careful that we don't support things that lead people astray. And I would just say, you know, I, I know of instances where people have left the Lord's church and have gone and have been members of various denominational churches or non-denominational churches that teach error concerning the plan of salvation. And I think that this is a passage that would say, don't do that. That's a serious thing. You know, it's, it's not the case that one church is as good as another. One church isn't as good as another. And if a church doesn't tell people the truth concerning how they're saved, that's not a church that one should be associated with, even though a lot of good may come from the church in terms of helping marriages and doing all sorts of, of helpful things. Remember, and, and I know the bell rang, but we always need to remember Cornelius, and Brother Lewis brings that out. Remember, Cornelius was a devout man. He prayed to God every day. He gave alms to the poor, but he was a lost man who needed the gospel from Peter. Just because someone is kind and does a lot of good works, that does not mean that spiritually they are in fellowship with God. And so we have to be careful that we don't bid God speed to uh, teaching that's contrary to Scripture.